I conclude this brief introduction with some additional remarks of his on the subject of chance and unpredictability in art. These from the occasion of a 2003 retrospective of his work, work at the South African National Gallery, where he spoke lines that resonate, I think, with the title of today's lecture. I trust in the contingent, he said, the inauthentic, the whim, the practical, as strategies for finding meaning. I would repeat my mistrust in the worth of good ideas and state a belief that somewhere between relying on pure chance on the one hand and the execution of a program on the other lies the most uncertain but the most fertile ground for the work we do. I think I have shown that it is not the clear light of reason or even aesthetic sensibility which determines how one works, but a constellation of factors, only some of which we can change at will. Before now turning the podium over to William Kentridge, I'd like to invite all of you to join us tomorrow at noon for a follow-up discussion with him and with panelists Larry Rinder, director of the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, Mark Rosenthal, curator of the Norton Museum of Art and editor of the volume William Kentridge Five Themes that accompanies the SF MoMA show, and my Berkeley colleague Kaja Silverman, professor of rhetoric and film studies, whose current work revolves around the themes of time-based art. We'll have some brief time for questions after the talk, in which case I ask you please just to approach the microphones that are located in either of the two, um, the two aisles, and William will uh, uh, acknowledge the questions directly. And now, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming William Kentridge, who will speak about something that ought to be dear to all our hearts, learning from the absurd. William Kentridge. I think we should leave the house lights on a little bit so that I can see you a little bit to even the terrain slightly. If they could be up at one level, it would be great. Um, okay, let's take them down a little bit. <laughs> this is all a way of delaying the moment when I actually have to start talking. Okay, no, no, now we're getting worse. We need to lose the lights <laughs> above the screen and we need to have the lights dimly on on the main part of the auditorium. <laughs> uh, that's good. No, 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 okay. Lose the top light and leave the lights on in the body of the auditorium, slightly. Okay, this is all good. I must tell you it's much easier talking in an art gallery, in an art museum context, no, we still don't have the house lights on in the back. It's much easier talking in an art gallery such as yesterday than in a university context, particularly such a distinguished university as, as this one. <laughs> no, we still need to have those lights on. Okay. We had them on an hour ago. We should get them in. Stop. Okay, good. I can see you can see. Um, there were four possible beginnings to this lecture. Uh, there was a short note on psychoanalysis. There's some remarks on folk traditions of Romania. There are questions on social and natural anthropology. And a short autobiographical note. But I realized when I arrived today that uh, Anthony Cascardi, who introduced me, in fact, is an expert on Cervantes, and if I had known that and that he was in the audience yesterday, I would certainly have taken all the remarks about Cervantes out of my talk. And in fear that amongst you here, there are people who are very expert on the fields both of psychoanalysis, the folk traditions of Romania, <laughs> and various elements of uh, social anthropology, I'm not going to start then. I'm going to start by showing a short video, a short fragment, which I hope will be in the safe terrain, which has to do with how one makes a rhinoceros. <laughs> That's what we don't need.
you're just going to have to bear with me to work out how to drive this. Okay, let's keep it. Um, to start with the rhinoceros, and we'll be coming back to the rhinoceros in different forms throughout the talk of Earth. Sorry, to get back to the question of the rhinoceros and its place. We will be coming back to the idea of the question of what the rhinoceros is and what it means as one of the themes that goes through the, through the talk. There is, in the end, I hope, a kind of coherence from the beginning of what I'm saying to the, to the end, but as a kind of a coherence that I'm very much relying on you making out of various digressions and different routes that I'll be following in the talk. And... I want to start, of course, by making some remarks about where the rhinoceros comes from and where the rhinoceros sits in our head. And the first and most obvious one in the piece that I showed you, obviously, it is from Mozart's Magic Flute. And it's a sequence in which Tamino uses the power of music to tame what in the uh, score is simply called wild beasts. And he uses his flute and the wild beasts are tamed, which in this case, in this production, which I did, became a rhinoceros. And on the one hand, there's, of course, a local resonance of rhinoceros as being very much a South African animal. But they're also very much a link between Southern Africa and Europe and the rest of the world. So we have it certainly, for example, in the form of the Piero Longhi painting of the rhinoceros in the carnival in Venice, people with masks looking at the rhinoceros. And, of course, in what this rhinoceros is based on, on Dura's great rhinoceros. Dura's rhinoceros, which is a really badly drawn rhinoceros, was badly drawn because what happened was a rhinoceros was on the way from Africa or from India to the courts of Europe for him to draw, and on the way the boat sank with the rhinoceros. So he was reduced to making his drawing on travelers' reports and descriptions, and descriptions of it. The next kind of obvious way in which the rhinoceros lands in our head is one of the images of the rhinoceros that is with us, Obviously, most recently, we have the fantastic rhinoceros, Dura's rhinoceros in the hold of the ship in Fellini's, um, and the ship sails on. But going one stage earlier, towards the center of the last century, we have that most emblematic of absurdist drama, Eugene Ionesco's play, Rhinoceros. And I certainly hadn't thought of that as being part either of the rhinoceros as I had drawn, or of the lecture I was going to today until somebody said, oh, you're talking about the absurd, are you talking about the theater of the absurd? And I thought, no, no, the talk has to do with Gogol and Shostakovich, but nothing to do with the theater of the absurd. And then I thought that, in fact, the first theater piece that I acted in in high school was in a UNESCO play called uh, La Chantatrice Chauve, the bald prima donna, as it was translated, or the bald soprano, it's sometimes translated at. And it's an emblematic, and it's a good play to start with. It's a, it takes the form of two couples talking to each other in a, in a sitting room. And it's completely urbane. Everybody is sipping their drinks and talking politely. But the text that UNESCO used was taken out of a phrase book, an English phrase book that he'd come across in Romania. So the dialogue is something in the order of our leghorn hats in season this year. May I have four sixpenny postage stamps, please? I suffer from headache, corns, a pain in my left side, a little bit lower, the other foot. Is this chicken fresh? I demand to speak to the superintendent. And this, almost more than the play Rhinoceros, is one of the things we'll be coming back to when we think about absurdity and urbanity, and the absurd as a disruption of the urbane. And the origins of this absurdism um, go, I suppose, immediately back to the middle of the 19th century, but from them a lot way further also. And the second play that I acted in, and I'll come back to the origins of the first UNESCO play, was in fact, if I thought of it, the last piece I performed when I had hopes that I would be an actor was to play a role in the, in the Tom Stoppard play, Travesties, 
in which I played the role of Tristan Zara. So in some strange way, just kind of biographically, there were odd elements of the absurd that, that I felt connected to. And in the same way that the rhinoceros has so many different memories, associations, trajectories forwards and backwards, that it becomes a completely kind of loaded image, a loaded concept, and one that one can't escape from. I have to, in a sense, take also a kind of psychological or psychic responsibility for the absurd, for the way that this has come so, to play such a large role and be so present in so many of the different projects that I do. But as an emblematic story of urbanity and its dislocation, I want to talk about the short story by Nikolai Gogol, which was written in 1837, called The Nose. And those of you who are at the lecture and the performance yesterday, I apologize for telling the story again. But it is a story that is, that is worth repeating. Um, it's a short story which Chekhov described as the greatest short story ever written. And who are we to disagree with Mr. Chekhov in the matter of short stories? And the story concerns one collegiate assessor, Kovalyov, who is a bureaucrat in the Russian bureaucratic service. He's approximately one third of the way up the hierarchy in the bureaucracy. And he wakes one morning and he finds that his nose has disappeared. And in the place of a nose, there is simply on his face a blank space, a smooth surface, which he refers to always that ridiculous blank space again. But the story itself starts one stage earlier with his barber, and his barber wakes up one morning and finds in the loaf of bread that his wife has given him for breakfast a piece of gristle, and then realizes that this piece of gristle is in fact a nose. And even worse, he recognizes the nose as being the nose of collegiate assessor Kovalyov, who he shaved, shaves three times a week. And uh, his wife insists that they get rid of the he gets rid of the nose immediately. So he goes through the town, through, some, through the town of St. Petersburg with the nose, looking for a place to get rid of it, and eventually comes to a bridge over the River Neva, and there he drops the nose over the parapet. And as he drops the nose over his parapet, he feels a hand on his shoulder, and he turns around, and there's a policeman standing behind him. Ivan Yankulovich turned pale. But at this point, everything became so enveloped in mist, it is really impossible to say what happened afterwards. So then we jump back to collegiate assessor Kovalyov, and he wakes up one morning and he finds his nose has disappeared. And the rest of the story, and the rest of the story is Kovalyov's attempt to find his nose and reattach it to his face. And he starts off by going to a coffee shop to think what he should do. And while he's in the coffee shop, he thinks he recognizes someone going into a house across the road. About two minutes later, the nose really did come out. It was wearing a gold braided uniform with a high standing collar and chamois trousers and had a sword at its side. From the plumes on its hat, one could tell that it had the exalted rank of state councillor. Okay, state councillor is about three ranks higher than collegiate assessor in the bureaucratic ranks. And Kovilov then wonders how is he actually going to then approach his nose. And he <laughs> follows his nose down the street, down the Nevsky Prospect, off the street into Kazan Cathedral. And then he thinks, what is the best way of approaching it, thought Kovalyov. Judging by its uniform, its hat, and its whole appearance, it must be a state councillor. But I'm damned if I know how to go about it. My dear sir, Kovalyov said. What do you want, replied the nose. <laughs> I don't know how best to put it, sir, but it strikes me as very peculiar. Don't you know where you belong? Please forgive me, said the nose, but would you mind telling me exactly what you are talking about? Explain yourself. How can I make myself clear, Kovalev wanted. My dear sir, continued Kovalev, it's plain enough for anyone to see unless, don't you realize that you are my own nose? The nose looked at the collegiate assessor and frowned a little. My dear fellow, you are mistaken. I am a person in my own right. Furthermore, I don't see that we can have anything in common. Judging from your uniform buttons, I should say you're from a different government department entirely. So here we have the heart of the story. How much of Kovalyov does he control and how much does he not? How much is he split against himself and how coherent is he? And there are, there are two themes in the story, both of which I'll keep coming back to during the course of the lecture. 
One has to do with the terror of hierarchy, the sense that in Russia, if you were of a lower rank, you'd be an abject terror of anyone higher than you. And if you were of a higher rank, you would have a kind of murderous contempt of anyone of a lower rank. So that's the one theme of the short story. The other theme has to do with the co coherence of the self. How unified are we as people and how divided are we against, against ourselves? Okay, but to go back to the story of Kovalev himself. So he's spoken to the nose in the cathedral, but the nose won't speak to him. So he then tries to go to the police to make a report, but of course the police chief is absent. And he goes to a newspaper office to try to put a classified advertisement in for the return of his nose, but the newspaper clerk refuses to take the advertisement. I can't print an advertisement like that in our paper, the clerk said after a long silence. Why not? I'll tell you, a paper can get a bad name. If everyone started announcing that his nose had run away, I don't know how it would all end. And enough false reports and rumors get passed, no, no, it's not possible. So defeated Kovalev returns to his house to contemplate what he calls that ridiculous blank space again. But then a policeman arrives and the policeman has found his nose. And the policeman says, it's very strange. We intercepted it just as it was boarding the stagecoach bound for Riga. Its passport was made out in the name of some civil servant. Strangely enough, I mistook it for a gentleman at first. Fortunately, I had my spectacles, and I could see that, in fact, it was really just a nose. And then Kovalev attempts to reattach the nose with spit, with glue, but it won't stick. He calls the doctor in, and the doctor also can't stick his nose back on, and the doctor says, why don't you put it in a jar of sour vodka and pickle your nose? And then you could take it around to country fairs and make a living from it. And uh, he offers to buy it. And it's even worse, there are now reports of the collegiate assessor's nose being seen in different parts, different parts of the town. And then one morning, Kovalev wakes up, and there is his nose on his face. And he recognizes the pimples in the right place. And in a sense, that's kind of the end of the story. But Gogol, the writer, hasn't quite finished with us. And Gogol, the writer himself, reflects on the story that he has just told us. Only now, after much reflection, writes Gogol, can we see that there is a great deal that is very far-fetched in the story? Apart from the fact, apart from the fact that it's highly unlikely for a nose to disappear in such a way and then reappear in various parts of the town dressed as a state councillor, it's harder to believe that Kovalev was so ignorant as to think that a newspaper would take advertisements about noses. He says, no, no, I don't understand it at all, not one bit. It's no use to... The strangest thing, the most incredible thing of all, is that authors should write about such things. That, I confess, is beyond my comprehension. It's just, no, I don't understand it at all. Firstly, it's no use to the country whatsoever. Secondly, but even then it's no use, I simply don't know what one can make of it. And yet, writes Gogol, if you stop to think for a moment, there is a grain of truth in it. Whatever you may say, these things do happen in the world. Rarely, I admit, but they do happen. So there we have uh, the Gogol short story, uh, The Nose. This is written in 1837. In 1928, the 22-year-old Dmitry Shostakovich turns it into an opera, also called The Nose, an astonishing thing. He's just out of the conservatoire, and he writes this opera, which is as indebted to Dada, as indebted to the fragmentation of modernism as to Gogol itself. And one of the things that's clear when you listen to the opera and go back to the story is that what one thinks of as quintessentially modern and part of modernism, the self-reflexivity, the fragmentation, the use of collage, in fact goes back, in this case, to, to Gogol. One normally thinks that at the end of realism, the end of realism, the great realist novels of Russia, then the form gets tired out and then people start playing games with it and reflecting on it. But in fact, what this short story does and its antecedents show that the roots and that tradition of modernism goes back centuries, because it goes back from Gogol to Lawrence Stern with his story, uh, with his book, um, Tristram Shandy. And in Tristram Shandy is another book about a man who loses his nose. Another whole digression. And also within the form of Tristram Shandy, of course, we have the author both being the author of the book and denying authorship of the book. 
claiming that the section on the nose is written by another writer entirely, who he quotes in Latin to prove that he, Lawrence Stern, is not the author of the book at all. And Stern, in turn, is um, indebted to uh, Cervantes, who in the Don Quixote has the same dislocation of himself as a reader of the story or presenter of the story and author of the story. So he can both take responsibility and deny responsibility for the stories as he, as he goes. And this sense of which one thinks of as quintessentially modern, this kind of mediation and shifting between being the author of something and simply a participant in reading it or receiving it, being both inside and out, part and separated from it, has its trajectory a long way back. So that's a formal trajectory. There's another, obviously, trajectory of what are stories of people losing their noses that goes back even further, even further. I was informed, and this I did not know until very recently, I was informed that in ancient Syria, and I don't know if there are Syrian scholars here, but maybe there are, <laughs> that in ancient Syria, one of the punishments that you would mete out to an enemy is that you would cut off their noses. And this was done physically to people but when one faction of Syrian society conquered another, or one sub-nation conquered another, the way this would be manifested is that the noses would be knocked off all the sculptures that existed of the previous rulers, as another example of the, this kind of strange, again, as with the Dura rhinoceros, a way in which there is a multiplication and a zooming down and an increased pressure on the story, on the image, on the associations with the image which I'm sure is also one of the reasons why it, it's so fruitful to, to work with it. Now, in, Gogol is obviously not the first writer to pose a person divided against themselves. But he does it in a very different way, I think, to other ways in which it was done. Obviously, in the Middle Ages, you have the classic division of the self from the soul, and you have the, all the Faust legends of Faust of a person who's separated from his soul. And, um, and then you have the figure of Hans Christian Andersen, who in 1841, this is just four years after Gogol, writes his fantastic short story uh, called The Shadow. And this is a story of a man who, a very short story, a man watches a woman across the road. So it's a narrow road, it's a city street, and with the light behind him, his shadow is projected onto the wall next to uh, the woman's window. And if he moves his body, his shadow moves and can start to peer into the room where the woman is. And he does this once, and his shadow follows the woman into the room and kind of leaves him, doesn't come back out. He waits and waits, but his shadow doesn't come back out of the room, and he's left alone. And uh, then in, after many years, he gradually grows, first a very weak shadow that can hardly be seen and only seen in full daylight, but gradually he grows a, a new shadow. In the meantime, his shadow itself has grown very wealthy and famous and has been uh, wealthy enough to buy itself a suit of clothes and boots and a smart plumed hat. And the shadow eventually, after years of traveling, returns to the town of its original owner, where there is the same dispute as to whether the, uh, the shadow should return or not. And the shadow says, well, you've got a new one, and you know, I don't like the way you dressed anymore, and I won't come back. But to, of course, complete it in the genre of Hans Christian Andersen, the shadow in its finery woos the princess and weds the princess. And to complete it on the wedding day has his original owner executed to remove any, any trace. But the, the Gogol, so there's, there's obviously, it was not Gogol operating completely in a vacuum. There was this a kind of sense of the fabulous as possible. But there's some interesting differences. In the Shostakovich opera, and one of the difficult things about doing this opera is that it flies so much against the conventions of opera. Both the short story and the opera are unusual in that it ends neither with a wedding nor with dead bodies on stage. <laughs> I mean, the, the Hans Christian Andersen is interesting in that it ends with both. But the, and I would say that it is in this way the kind of indeterminate, self-reflective ending that goes nowhere. The, the end of the opera ends with kind of very unremarkable. There's no big C major chord at the end. There's no triumphant chorus as you get at the end of the Mozart opera. It kind of dies away. And in terms of directing op the opera, one of the hard things is what to do with the last 40 seconds of music. 
The three minutes before the end of the very end of the opera, the paragraph I read to you about Gogol reflecting on the short story will be spoken as a kind of reflection on what has happened, but the last 40 seconds are still stumping me. But one of the interesting things about that is that it makes the very act of disruption, taking a conventional logic and disrupting that logic, makes that act of disruption the subject of the story and the essence of the story, rather than something that leads you on either to an allegory of something else, or a metaphor for something else, or a route to a story of love or a story of, a story of, of death. And this, I think, is one of the key things of the absurd and the interest in the absurd, and why for me the uh, Ionesco play, The Bald Prima Donna, which really doesn't go anywhere, but is a living demonstration of how the world can be disrupted and our expectations disrupted, for me is a more interesting play than Rhinoceros, even though that has fabulous images, but it has such a heavy weight of allegory laden onto it that the space of the absurd somehow gets tamed and brought to book. Now, one of the other things about, interesting things about um, the Gogol story is that at that period, there was a great interest in Russia and in Europe on what was called nosology. <laughs> and nosology is a subsect of really of phrenology, of the studying of the human head. What is a criminal nose? What is a Jewish nose? What is an Aryan head? How does one characterize not just races, but attributes and morality through all these different ways? And there's another connection, which is an interesting one, to go back to Longi and Dura's rhinoceros, and this has to do in the category of connoisseurship. Now, connoisseurship, which arose more or less and was developed also at the, towards the end, later than Gogol, towards the later part of the 19th century, was a kind of way, an attempt to get past questions of taste through to something more objective and scientific. And connoisseurship arose out of questions of how one attributed different works of art. And before one would do it in a rather vague way by saying, well, that looks like Titian's kind of brush mark or the, the, the scumbling looks familiar or I can just tell that that's a Giorgione and not a Titian. And what the developer, whose name I forget, of Konoshep did, he discovered or found out that, in fact, many artists had very characteristic ways of painting the most unimportant parts of the paintings. So that, for example, the way that Caravaggio painted an ear was very different to the way that another painter would have painted an ear. So the way to attribute and understand and give good attribution of paintings was to do a close survey of tiny features of the picture. How are the nostrils painted? How are the ears painted? You know, what was a Mantegna nose? What was a Michelangelo nose? And in this way grew up a whole science of attribution and also of description of these different pieces, which became very closely allied to kind of police identikits and identification of people. And there was a very strange and interesting line between the fanciful in Gogol the aesthetic in the area of uh, connoisseurship and the controlling in the field of police and forensics. And it's, it's no coincidence that all the Herlock, Sherlock Holmes short stories, which also have to do with these paying, taking, paying great attention to details which seem very much at the edge and not the center of what is being done, became all grew up at the same, at the same time. But when I was talking about the absurd, one of the things I'm talking about is the dis disruption of the urbane, a sense of being in control of how the world is organized and how, how we live our lives in those, in those cities. And this disruption of the urbane and what we think of as under control and that which is not under our control is something that still continues. And I think in many ways the absurd in its depiction of these disruptions is one way of understanding some of the other depictions. For an example, there was a photograph which I saw in a Johannesburg newspaper uh, a week ago. And in this photograph are clearly identified the following suburban artifacts, or the following artifacts. Uh, the bottom half of a patio umbrella. A golf club which looks like it's either a sand wedge or a seven iron. Uh, a bush knife or a machete. Uh, the, the pole you would have in the game of swing ball when you knock balls with a tennis racket from side to side to try to get the ball to spiral up a pole. 
a painted uh, curio wooden giraffe about this high, such as you can find on the street corners. And the common element of these, or what they were all united at in this photograph, was that these were all weapons of choice, or weapons that people were brandishing in a crowd that was attacking foreigners in a suburb of, of Johannesburg. Part of the terrible xenophobic attacks we had uh, during the course of last year, these were all some of the weapons. So there's an extraordinary shift just within that image of what one thinks of as very quiet, domestic, suburban artifacts in this very other wild and dangerous and terrific context. And within Johannesburg, certainly, the disruption of what is domestic and what is wild is very clear. I mean, one has to understand that in Johannesburg, not just in Johannesburg, in South Africa, I would venture to say in the whole of Africa, rhinoceroses are kind of most closely allied to highly bred poodles or small dogs um, in several different ways. If one has to think of the fences that surround them and the fences that surround uh, domestic life, these animals which one likes to think of as wild when one goes to a game reserve are essentially being astonishingly protected and looked after. So the safest, the most calm place in South Africa to be is to be amongst the lions, the rhinoceroses, the elephants in a game reserve where you sleep so soundly at night, where you are not troubled by any sounds that go off in the night as opposed to living in the suburbs or living in the townships or living in the informal settlements where the nights are times of fear and where if you're living in the suburbs there's an ever-increasing range of protections and fences and electrified fences and security guards and private armies that kind of make, make a peace, which one only finds out in the wild. So that's, that kind of inversion of what one expects to be wild and what in fact is suburban. I mean, there's a whole question of kind of street, the street corner civil war that goes on in South Africa day by day, all the time. Um, that is also a kind of both within the very safe ambit of the urban and also spreads out in completely uh, surprising and difficult ways. The interest in the absurd, I think, as a depiction of this, of things which don't stick together, of things which are incoherent, a nose which leaves a man, the changing of ranks between them, has to do with two different possibilities. And I'll try to illustrate some of these possibilities through kind of examples of fragments of films, no coherent films, but fragments of films that I've been working on for the last two years in the, in the studio. So the two ways in which I think the absurd can function. One is that it gives us a sense of other logics, of other possibilities of how the way the world is organized. What happens is that we become so, the world becomes so naturalized to us and processes become so naturalized that it takes an act of will, it takes an act of determination to understand that there are possible other logics. So, for example, until September last year, there was a general acceptance that bankers knew best. And there were all sorts of derivatives and things that mere mortals couldn't understand, but it was our lack but that, in fact, it had been proved since uh, the fall of the uh, Iron Curtain in the 1980s that, in fact, you know, we'd reached the end of history and that uh, Mr. Greenspan knew how the world operated. And in this case, it took a very public absurdity, the uh, kind of collapse of enormous markets and things, to show that that logic was not necessarily the only logic within which the world can operate. So that's one way in which the absurd is pointing to the contingency of the way we think we understand the world or the way that the world organizes itself is one part. And the second part is that it shows us the physical and mental act we do in trying to construct a sense of the world as it arrives to us. The way in which we assume it is all naturalized and the world simply arrives at us, but every now and then there's a way in which we understand, no, the world is arriving as a chaotic set of impulses and we do this huge work, it's both kind of mental and rational and psychic the whole time, to keep all the different pieces in place and believe in the coherence of how they operate. And there are a few fragments that I'd like to show you that were kind of exercises in seeing how one could, 
They weren't done as demonstrations of the absurd. They were done for the pleasure of seeing what happened, either if one ran a camera backwards or one tried with different kinds of playing with actors to start depicting the nose. So they're fragments from the making of the opera, and they're also fragments made in the studio. And the first one I want to show you is called Building a Library, and it's about, I think, 50 seconds long, and I'll show you and then talk about it. Um, I mean, it's clear that I'd built a, I mean, what I was using, I was using a modified, using a modified, the thing they use for uh, pitching baseballs to launch the books, which my assistant had on the floor of the studio and was launching the books um, up at me, and it took a long time for us to practice getting them in the right, <laughs> in the right angle, and we were really good. Um, <laughs> Not quite, but nearly. <laughs> I mean, in this case, what it is, it's about, on the one hand, believing that sound is launching the book up towards me and I'm catching it, when we all know, in fact, the camera is simply running backwards and I'm happily throwing books away. But the trans, the trick, what, or not the trick, what was done there, which I discovered when putting this fragment was together, was to do two things, to run the film backwards, but to run the sound forwards. So that you have the sound of the books landing which sounds like the book's being launched. So it's a, what I'm talking about is we have one sound and you have an image, and between the two one constructs a whole possible world in which they could make sense. And this way in which we take these fragments and force them into a sense is one of the, is one of the key things, one of my ongoing interests in how we go through the world and how one can make images and, and work together. There's another similar fragment that I'd like to show. These are, this is a fragment which was being made testing various sections of the opera out. And within, inside Shostakovich's opera, which is this extraordinary kaleidoscope and collage of different musical forms and styles and ways of making an opera, there, there are, for me, extremely fortunately, several places where there is only music. There are no singers on stage, and there's a kind of open-ended terrain with which to with which to play. And one of the principles I'm slowly walking, working towards, the opera will be finished in a year's time, is that on stage we see the history of Kovalyov, the man who loses his nose. And that means that on the screen behind him, we can see a history of the nose itself, the nose's own journey. And the nose at one point has this idea of wanting to, be, uh, to reach real heights of fame, not simply to be a state councillor, but to be much higher than that. And what you have to do, not only in Russia in the 1930s, but also in St. Petersburg earlier, is that you obviously has to, you have to aspire to be an equestrian statue, or on an equestrian statue. So this is, this is kind of preparing the horse for him to be in the equestrian statue. But I'm going to fast forward through a lot of this. Um, so this is a four-minute section simply of 
percussion. And the piece is not yet, the, the sequence of four minutes of percussion is not by any means ready, but I'd like to show you the last minute and a half approximately, and particularly the last kind of 30 seconds in terms of, well, let's watch it. Okay, we can start here. This is Shostakovich playing the piano, but the hope is that if we get the editing right, we'll be able to absolutely, even though you know he's playing the piano, make it seem, make, ourselves, make you unable to stop believing that those fingers are in fact playing the drums and the timpani and the snare drum and the 15 instruments that the whole battery of the orchestra is playing to make that, to make that moment. And to go one stage further, to think about how it is that we can take these fragments and construct uh, from these fragments, force ourselves or are unable to stop ourselves trying to understand a logic, to get the world to make sense. I'll tell a story of my daughter Alice, who at the age I think was three when this occurred, three or four, maybe, I think three. And I'd been telling her a story about a cat in the garden and how the cat was being chased by a dog. So the cat came in through the cat flap and escaped. And then I heard her retelling her mother the story. And she said, well, there was the kitty in the garden, and then the dog came, and then the cat flapped its wings and it escaped. <laughs> and that sense of from the very beginning needing to make sense of the world. And if the world doesn't make sense, you will restructure some, some fragment, something till in the end you have something that has a coherence. And this is something obviously we do when we mishear, when we can't hear quite being said. Part of us is predicting, filling in, allowing other things to, to, to make sense, to cohere. And this activity and this, this very practical activity of making sense of the world is one of the things that the absurd shows us that we are doing. You have something that is palpably out of kilter with our naturalized experience of the world. And it is our job both to either successfully bring these pieces together or in the activity of understanding they won't cohere, they're not gonna stick. However and often he licks his nose and sticks it back to his face, it's gonna fall down. Through that very activity of incomprehension, we understand the work that we do do of that parts of the world that we can comprehend. There is another example that I'll just show you as another piece of trying to work with what is the nature of things that fragment and how do we put them, how do we put them together. Okay. This is this is a projection which in fact will be shown on the fire curtain of the, on the front curtain of the theater at the Opera House in 
uh, when the Shostakovich opera is shown, and it's shown, in fact, while the orchestra is tuning up before the opera has begun. But it has to do with the effort, the wanting, the wanting something to make sense, and that shift between incomprehension and recognition as pieces finally fall into place. In this case, the pieces fall into place for us, I hope, in about 14 seconds. Uh, but otherwise, it's something that we ourselves force them, force them into. Um, so that was a project that turned into a whole series of sculptures about objects that disintegrate and reconfigure, much the way when an orchestra is tuning, you have a chaos of different instruments, each playing their own piece. And then when the A is given by the oboe, there's a moment of coherence, and then it disintegrates, disintegrates again. So it's not specifically called for in the opera in its playing, but it seems to me uh, one of the ways of starting to play with the idea of coherence and fragmentation of Kovalev and his, and his nose. I'll show you just to keep talking about the actual making of the opera and the idea of the nose's projection being on stage, a fragment of a workshop that we did in preparation for the opera uh, about a year ago, in which I worked with a group of actors and dancers just playing with some of the music and looking at different kinds of projections. So it's, it's a kind of a foretaste of what's going to be there, but there are a couple of details that I wanted to, to look at. This continues, you will see, as the people keep going. And what it is, it's trying to find the grammar of what's needed. So within working within incomprehension or things that are ridiculous, one of the attempts is to find, even within that, the right way of either catching books if they're thrown from the floor or you're throwing them away, or in this case, finding the right kind of right. syncopation for the right. workers with the right. Right. Keep your hands to yourself. And oh. And out. Okay. So that's kind of the material, that the, the way of working with it, in the belief that once you've accepted the convention of this nose going on its own journey, one has to give the nose both an autonomy and take him seriously. So there's a lot of work into what that shadow does and can't do on the stage. But the piece itself, if one talks about the, the timing of when Shostakovich wrote the opera, which is in 1928. So it's at the end of the great era of Russian modernism and the Russian avant-garde. The opera itself had three or four performances and then was suppressed and was not performed again until after Stalin's death, I think in the mid-1960s. And it's performed occasionally now, it's getting more and more performed. Uh, the performance of my production in New York is by no means the first in the United States. There's been one at Bard College, I think the Boston Opera is doing one um, as we speak. But it certainly is a relatively unusual opera, as I said, because it lacks so many of what one traditionally associates with grand with grand opera. The second last piece I'm going to show you 
is another piece related and will be used in the, in the Shostakovich opera, not in the form in which it's used here, but as some of the raw material. And it's material that's trying to look at what it meant, really, to be doing that opera at that period, in the late 1920s. And looking at, as it were, with the hindsight we get, at looking at what happened in Russia in the, 19, in the 1930s. So Shostakovich, as we know, survived, um, had a checkered and difficult and contradictory relationship to the powers that were, to the Communist Party in Russia. But many other people, like the great director Meyerholt, of course, did, did not survive. Was arrested in 1938 and executed in 1941, which could very well have been uh, Shostakovich's fortune, being either faithful to the party or not faithful to the party. There was certainly no guarantee of either surviving or not surviving what happened. And one of the one of the ways we have to try to make sense or try to come to terms with what happened in the 1930s, both with the end of the avant-garde and with the destruction of that whole utopian idea in the terror and the purges of the 1930s, is trying to find what would be an appropriate form for describing this. Is comedy the appropriate way of looking at these great social catastrophes? Is tragedy, tragedy always seems so linked to the particular failings of a single individual that it seems completely unable to deal with, or inappropriate, to deal with huge social catastrophes such as we've had in the last century, where it's not just 20 people or 1,000 people in a city dying, but millions on an enormous, on an enormous scale, where the, the kind of the shrinkage of the world into the figure of one person in tragedy seems inadequate. And there's something of the disruption of our understanding of the world in comedy and in that subsection of comedy and tragedy, the absurd, which seems the only appropriate way to begin to approach, approach these, these questions. I'm going to show you one, this fragment, which is a series of different pieces which will occur in different scenes in the opera. Here they're edited into one four or five minute uh, piece, and I'll show you the whole, the whole piece. The music from this is not Shostakovich. The music from this is written by the South African composer Philip Miller, who I've worked with for many years. And it, the piece I'm showing is one of the eight fragments which makes up the projection piece called I Am Not Me, The Horse Is Not Mine, which is on exhibition at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And I, I have been told that from either side of the Bay Bridge, the opposite side looks impossibly far and unreachable, and that the two parts are hardly on speaking terms. But um, there are more of these pieces in the, in the exhibition. It's not nearly as bad. I mean, in New York, I understand that people below 18th Street don't go up to 45th Street. <laughs> and that the division of the world into these medieval villages, who are, if not at war with each other, certainly live pretending the others don't exist. And we haven't yet reached the 4,000 different languages of Papua New Guinea but the isolation is certainly moving in that, in that direction. This we can play quite loud.
Come back to a 20th century rhinoceros before ending. One further rhinoceros that needs to make his appearance is, of course, Wittgenstein's rhinoceros. When Wittgenstein was at Oxford with Bertrand Russell, and he was trying to see whether he should be an aeronautical engineer um, or a philosopher, he used to hound uh, Bertrand Russell, and Bertrand Russell used to refer to him as my German, who used to come and and he said, Bertrand Russell, in one of his uh, reminiscences, talks about how uh, he would always be hounded by Wittgenstein, who, who continually asserted that the only thing that existed were words and, asser and assertions. And Bertrand Russell tried to convince him that he should at least accept that there, in this calm Oxford sitting room, there was not a rhinoceros present. And as he wrote, he made a great show of opening the curtains and looking underneath the sofa and underneath the table but Wittgenstein refused to be convinced that there was not a rhinoceros in the room. And to the extent that that rhinoceros obviously sits inside us in all these multiple layers and associations, whether spoken or implicitly spoken, the rhinoceros was certainly there. But of course, the other part, to go back to the nose and the end of the nose story and the nose's trajectory, 
was that space where assertions and the world get completely inter inter interchanged, where you have the great purges and the show trials where language itself ceases to make any sense, when in the term of a completely disrupted logic, any statement made, if it was made by the party, was de facto correct, and every accusation in its own way had to be accepted as, as correct. And what the opera, I think, does implicitly, because it's certainly not looking at the short story does, and uh, UNESCO does in his absurdism, is not so much point a big finger to saying, this is what Stalin was doing, but points a finger, and not a finger, but enables us to experience the nature of that disruption and incoherence that happened, and offers not necessarily a picture of it, or even necessarily a model for understanding it, but certainly a way of maintaining an agency between how the world appears and how we understand it. At the end of the opera, of course, as in the end of the short story, um, the nose returns to Kovalev. He wakes up one morning and there his nose is back in place. And that's kind of the end of the story. And that, of course, has to have its concomitant ending for the nose on the screen. And I'm going to finish by showing you Again, in its rough form, not completely edited, the last uh, or two minutes of what would be projected on the screen, while on the stage in front you have Kovalev and his barber singing and dancing and rejoicing at the return of his nose. When they go ka 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 ka, that's laughter in operatic terms. As I said, we do have, uh, we do have uh, some time for some questions. I would ask you to come forward to the microphones in either of the aisles. Uh, make sure your questions are as brief and succinct as possible. We'll pause for just a minute to let people who uh, need to leave uh, now uh, exit the hall. And then um, I would just ask you to line up at the, at the microphones if you have uh, questions. Great. OK. Let's, oh, let's see if people give them one minute, people one minute to leave.
Sure. I have a question about how you decide the accessibility of your work. Yesterday, when I was watching your performance, I wanted to slow time down so I could understand all the layers. And I wanted to come back afterwards and read your words and so on. And I don't know how much of that ability you want to give out or not. Or how do you, how do you make that kind of decision so that there's just not a flood of you everywhere? Um, the short answer is that I tried to go really slowly yesterday. When I first did it, it was apparently completely incomprehensible. <laughs> so the incomprehensibility level has come down. Part of it is good that people don't understand because it doesn't make sense. And um, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's, it is definitely a case, certainly with, for example, the Shostakovich opera. If you hear it twice, it's better than once. If you hear it four times, the music is much clearer. Uh, people who've seen the lecture twice said they understood it the second time round. Uh, it is a problem of things that you see that you see once. So I try to make it clear, but not all of it is clear. Okay. Hi. Um, you mentioned that tragedy had to inevitably be of an individual, and that might be the ancient. Greek definition of tragedy, but I was wondering whether that is also, I mean, I, I love the absurd, so I, I applaud the work you're doing, but I wonder whether there wouldn't, might not be a way of reconceiving tragedy at the scale, at, at a broader scale in modern times. I mean, I haven't yet seen it depicted, so that, I mean, I haven't yet seen, if you think of the depiction, say, of the Holocaust, you've either got Anne Frank, where it gets reduced to the story of one young girl, or you get Schindler's List, where it's you know, where it's not just whether Schindler is good or bad, but whether it's a good or bad Nazi with him, the individual. Um, the way we kind of generally, even a, a huge, enormous, expansive book like the Grossman book on the Second World War, the way it has to be written is in terms of a family and their history. And obviously the nose is about one, one person. But there's something in the disruption of, um, of a realist narrative that I think is one way, it's not, certainly not the only way, but one way of expanding the scope of what is depicted. And there's no doubt that many of the individualized stories is one of the only ways that we can understand it. You know, enormous numbers cease to have an emotional feeling and you can rather much more exact, you know, multiply from a particular small feeling outwards. So I'm as, I'm as susceptible to that as anyone. But it's a question of whether, say, for example, to look at the purges and the show trials. The language of those show trials is in itself so kind of gruesomely comic and absurd um, that one needs to find some form of approaching that. Thank you. Yes. Um, I was interested in your experience with, with changes in medium throughout your life. You used to do more static images, right? and uh, how you feel, or how, what kind of comfort or discomfort you get from, from using, you know, bringing modern technology, digital animation. And also another small question is, is it your nose? Uh, it's, I wouldn't say that it's specifically my nose, but when deciding what the nose was going to look like, I decided it wasn't going to be a little snub nose and it wasn't going to be an aquiline. It was going to be a kind of familiar, good Johannesburg Jewish nose, and that's kind of... <laughs> Um, not more specifically than, uh, than that. The question about the shift in form and digital technology, a lot of the work I do is in movement, whether it's film or animation, but there's a huge amount that's just not very interesting to look at here and doesn't look great projected of drawings, of etchings, of prints. I've been recently working on a, large se on a series of large uh, drawings of flowers, of peonies. So they're kind of, there's, a, there's a range of other work that is static and looks like a drawing. Yeah, I, saw, I saw the MoMA exhibit. It was amazing. Sorry? The, the San Francisco MoMA. It was fantastic. But I, I, and I, it was so interesting, the difference between the, the static, you know, the, the prints and, and the drawings versus the, like the projection of the, the circle, this uh, spherical projection was really interesting. But Thank you. Thank you. Stuff. Thank you very much. Hello. You referenced uh, Shostakovich operating in the time he did in Russia and the Soviet Union. 
Do you think that uh, his writing The Nose was influenced, or have you thought at all, by the Yiddish theater, um, Gosset or Habima, the Hebrew theater going on at the time, the relationship with the people working in that I think, area? I mean, I think there's an... When I was going to talk about uh, the social history of Romania, that's what I was going to talk about. Um, <laughs> There is a tradition which I've heard of, and I don't know much about it, of absurdist performances in rural Romania as a peasant activity, and I th think somewhere I heard specifically Jewish of nonsense poetry, which is certainly behind uh, Tristan Zara and the other Romanian Jewish Dadaists that came from there, that in other words weren't inventing something completely new, but as with so much of avant-garde work, it's taking something of a peasant route of a peasant route and bringing it into a city context where it appears as something completely new. So atonality in music, which one thinks of as this extremely urban phenomenon coming out of there, in fact has its roots in different tuning systems in folk music in, in Eastern Europe and gets highlighted when it's brought into a concert hall. And these kind of much more common folk traditions, which also would have been behind uh, Faustus, which was certainly behind the Hans Christian Andersen stories, get a different and have a different meaning when they're brought into the rational world of the urban. And I think that the Yiddish theater, I'm sure there was a particular group, theater group and writers group that Shostakovich was very influenced by, but I don't know the specifics of that, of that history. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, this, this is an astounding experience and I'm trying to account for the phenomenon the phenomenology of it. And as I'm trying to, to put words on it, what, what comes are, it's like a living ritual, and it's like living in a fairy tale, where there are all the flavors uh, and the aromas of um, the real world and the cultural world and the historical world, but they're all they all come together. It's, it, what is the difference between the way you put it together, which could be a very uncomfortable chaos, but is not? It, it's more like a transformative ritual. Thank you. I mean, I don't think there's a question, but thank you. Okay. There's, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So my question has to do with um, maybe it's best... Uh, kind of highlighted in the moment where you showed us the clip that's to play when the orchestra's tuning. And so we see, um, you know, like fragments of things that come into face. And to me, that really seems to point to the root of the matter that you've been talking about, which is the way that we just, you know, we yearn for coherence. And so there was this moment when we all like sighed in unison, like, oh, it's a face, thank God. Oh, we are real subjects, oh, wonderful. And there seems to be some way um, in which also kind of the nose as like those fragments of ourselves which kind of seek, um, seek expression and, and want to be kind of realized in, in some kind of uh, like ambitious, uh, like uh, public life. Um, and I'm wondering if you would say more either about that or the connection that you ha seem to have alluded to between um, what you've been calling these spaces of urbanity and then also kind of uh, and, and political life, really. And, and I'm, I'm wondering if you'd say more a little bit about that and, and this project of, of making coherence that we just seem to not be able to stop ourselves from needing to do. <laughs> I mean, when I describe those objects in the, to talk about the political and the absurd, those garden objects and suburban objects, which are the weapons of choice of this, uh, of this crowd attacking foreigners, um, it's not trying to make coherence of that, but it's trying to say kind of a disruption of our naturalized understanding of the world is present out there in the world. And that to understand it, we have to move away from the reassuring understanding, say, of suburban life as safe, as calm. I mean, one of the extraordinary things also as a South African talking to Americans, one of the extraordinary things about 9-11 was the surprise with which it was greeted by Americans. That the kind of, there was an expectation that if you're middle class in America, 
you would you know, live to an old age till medical science could uh, keep you alive forever, and the sudden death out of the sky was not part of your birthright. And in so many other parts of the world, whether you're working class or middle class, there's a sense of contingency and risk in daily life. So no one was astonished at the grief, but at the surprise that the world being organized differently from outside was kind of a surprise at how surprised everyone here or so many people, so many people, let me not generalize, the view we had from South Africa of what was, what was happening. It wasn't, it was just a kind of a surprise at, a, at an understanding of the world. So it's a, a kind of as if the world, the suburban world of garden sprinklers is kind of safe, but in fact there, there are other things that, that are out there. Thank you. Hello, thank you for your work and your talk. I just, th I have a question that sort of follows on this comment that you just made. Did you consider updating the opera given what's happened in the last few years? Well, I wasn't going to rewrite Shostakovich's music, nor Gogol's short story, but it is set, I mean, the opera, the production, the particular production is set in 1928, so to speak, rather than 1837. Um, in the belief that kind of the terrors of hierarchy that were present in Tsarist Russia are not so very different to terrors of hierarchy that existed in, uh, not just in Soviet Russia, but in Russia now and in, all over the world now. So that, it's shifted that way, but that's a way of enabling me to use the language of constructivism, of, um, of suprematism, of different kinds of languages that were evolving in the years preceding the opera and immediately afterwards within it. But I'm sure one could do, one could do a modern dress uh, allegorical production, but I'm not. Um, thank you so much. It's really been wonderful to see the work that you're doing. Um, and I guess I'm just taking it back to the idea of the absurd and the tragic and what those relationships are, uh, especially things like mass death and things that are just horrible. Um, and that people can't comprehend even if you try to wrap your mind around it. And so I'm thinking, I'm in performance studies, so I'm thinking about theater specifically as a medium to kind of, especially multimedia theater that has, you have your animations, and I, I'm familiar with the work you've done with the uh, Handspring Puppet Company, and so you have all these different levels of, of representation. And so I guess I just wonder how you see that theater as a mediation between the tragic um, not tragic as in, you know, uh, a Greek myth, but just the common, the everyday tragic and the absurd, where you have laughing and then you have uh, the nose being assassinated over and over and over again, and how, what, what is, what do you think is productive about that sort of dissonance? I think what's productive about that dissonance is that it is accurate of how the world is. I think that's the surprise. So, for example, at the time of the show trials, when Bukharin is being uh, fighting for his life within the, within the plenum of the, of the Communist Party, where he's been the loyal servant for all these years and he's finally they're accusing him of all sorts of things he's not done. Um, on the one hand, he's fighting for his life. On the other hand, in the minutes of the meeting are continuous outbreaks of, of laughter. I mean, just to read you a, a fragment of one. Um, Bukharin says, it's easy for you to talk about me. What will you lose after all? Look, if I'm a saboteur, a son of a bitch, then why spare me? I make no claims to anything. I'm just describing what's on my mind, what I am going through. If this in any way entails any political damage, however minute, then no question about it. I'll do whatever you say. Brackets. Laughter. Why are you laughing? There is nothing, fun, absolutely nothing funny about any of this. Please permit me to finish and explain this whole business to the best of my ability. Kaganovich then says, you are not very good at explaining it. That's the whole point. Bukharin, whether I explain it well or poorly, I am speaking sincerely. My thoughts are sincere. Kaganovich, not every act of sincerity is correct. Bukharin, in any case, I am speaking sincerely. Molotov, and we too are criticizing you sincerely. Brackets, laughter, uproar in the room. Bukharin, comrades, I implore you not to interrupt me because it is difficult for me. It is simply physically hard for me to speak. Voice, blackmailer, Vorishliov, you scoundrel, keep your trap shut. How dare you speak like that? Bukharin, 
but you must understand it's very hard for me to die, Stalin, and it's easy for us to go on living, brackets, noise in the room, prolonged laughter. That's the transcript of the, of the script itself. Those are the minutes kept in the archives which were released, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. So, I mean, that is the, that is the world. And why theater? Sorry? And why theater as the medium to tell this particular? Oh, theater because that's what I work in, making drawings, and that's the given. Whether it's film or drawing or that's, you know, that's the me. If I was a writer, it would be in writing. If I was a songwriter, it would be in songs, I think, rather than any matter of principle. Okay, so we have time for one more question, and this will be the last one. I was, wondering if you, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between the absurd and utopia, because it seems to me that at one level, there's a notion of realism going on, that these, these instances aren't absurd that happen. Well, if one wants a, a, quick, a quick thought of uh, utopia, that section on building the library, catching those books so perfectly, is a kind of utopian perfection. Because if you run the world backwards, everything is kind of perfect. You take, uh, <laughs> we have one final piece here. This is one of the first pieces I did looking at what happens when you run a camera backwards. And so I simply started with a whole pile of objects, which one then throws about at random around the room. And one of the things you can clearly see is that when it goes backwards, one's catching is phenomenal. <laughs> you do not miss a drop, ever. So the hard work when this was working out how to turn pages backwards so it looked like they were going the right way, <laughs> and how to walk backwards into the chair. But the rest kind of does itself. So if one talks about the absurd and utopia, for me this is, this is a kind of, it's also then I suppose about the impossibility of utopia, one understands the way in which uh, physics has to kind of go backwards for this to be done. I mean, when I did this fragment, I had no idea that I'd be going on doing these things, running things backwards for years to come afterwards. Okay, and so on. So he goes on. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, William Kentridge. Thank you all. Thank you.